The NFL is a very straightforward ecosystem. You've got your predators, you've got your prey, and you've got the unlucky bastards that get paid to try to keep them apart. Like in most other ecosystems though, there is a very clear and defined food chain. The better hunter you are, the more you eat, the higher on the chain you go. During the 2016 season in the vacuum left in the wake of J.J. Watt's season-ending back injury, a new apex predator emerged to stake his claim to the very top of that food chain. His name, Khalil Mack. His team, the Raiders. And these days, he might just be the deadliest hunter of them all. Looking at the total package that is Khalil Mack, you could legitimately argue that he is the most physically gifted pass rusher in the NFL. He's quicker and more fluid than Jadavian Clowney, he's longer than Vic Beasley, and he's more powerful than Von Miller. Watching him scream off the edge every single week, it's almost impossible to not see a carbon copy of the great Lawrence Taylor. The speed, the strength, the relentlessness in his pursuit, it all comes together to make Mack one of the, if not the most feared edge rusher in the league. He is so hard to deal with because unlike a lot of other pass rushers that might be kind of one trick ponies, Matt can beat you in every way imaginable. First and foremost, he's got the speed to take the edge on anyone. Mack has a 40 inch vertical leap that translates into an insane first step, so pretty much every tackle he plays against has to overset themselves outside just to stop him from getting the edge at will. And even then, sometimes that is not enough to contain him because he is so explosive and so fast that he'll be able to dip around the corner anyway. That speed is the foundation for every other part of his game. He's more well known for his raw power, of course, but his speed is what allows that power to work in the first place. When these tackles start predictably oversetting themselves outside, it gives Mack all the room he could ever want inside to win with his counter moves. Whether it's with a club swim combo or a rip or a swipe or anything of that nature, the fact that tackles have to sell out so hard against his speed rush means that he gets a ton of opportunities to win with these counter moves. And, like I mentioned earlier, the best counter he's got off of that speed is his power. We'll look at the first quarter of the Chiefs game in week 6 as an example. Mack is going up against left tackle Eric Fisher one on one. He explodes out of his stance off the line of scrimmage, as per usual, and gets 4 yards deep so fast that Fisher is convinced that Mack is trying to get the corner with a speed rush. As Mack throws out that one arm stab into Fisher, you can see Fisher ever so slightly leaning towards the back of the pocket, anticipating that Mack is going to try to dip his shoulder low on the corner. That lean from Fisher is a way for him to try to leverage himself into that potential shoulder dip, which will ideally help him wash Mack around the back of the pocket. It's a pretty common way of handling a speed rush. However, Mack knows that Fisher is scared of his speed and that he's going to try to sell out against that dip and rip outside. So Mack putting his hand on Fisher's inside shoulder with that one arm stab was completely intentional. That placement is not by accident, and here's why. As Fisher leans towards the back of the pocket, watch how Mack uses his strength and Fisher's own momentum against him to throw him to the back of the pocket and open up the lane inside. There is nothing that Fisher could do here to stop Mack from getting inside once he fully committed to stopping that speed rush. Absolutely nothing. Once his hips were perpendicular to the line of scrimmage and he was caught leaning, it was over. His leverage was compromised, and if you give someone as strong as Khalil Mack a leverage advantage on top of his strength, he's going to toss you all over the yard without breaking a sweat. And Fisher was not the only victim of this move either. In week 8, Buccaneers right tackle DeMar Dotson fell for the exact same thing. Just look at how far around his hips are turned in his kick slide when Mack finally makes contact. He's not just perpendicular to the line of scrimmage, he's way past that point already. He's in a position to own that corner and shut down any speed rush in front of him, but that's exactly what Mack wanted him to do. He wanted his hips to be turned around this far, he wanted him to overset outside to stop the speed rush, because then all he had to do was just get under his pads, throw him again to the back of the pocket, and flatten down inside for the easy sack on Jameis Winston. Just like with Eric Fisher, once Dotson fully committed to containing the edge, he was toast. There was nothing he could do to stop this once he lost that leverage advantage. Mack abused tackles with these inside counter moves on a weekly basis. In fact, I would consider his speed to power move inside to be his signature move, and it highlights exactly why he is such a dominant player. He's versatile. It's not every day that you can find an edge rusher that can either run around you or run through you to get where he wants to go. Usually it's one way or the other, but only the truly special players can do both at the same time. 
That's why really the only reliable way to slow him down that I've seen is to constantly give him extra blocking attention. Whether it's dedicated chips with tight ends and running backs or double teams inside with guards, you always have to have two guys on him. One sitting outside to slow down the speed rush and one sitting inside to anchor against the counter moves. Whether it's the guard, the tackle, the tight end, the running back, it really doesn't matter who is playing what role in the protection scheme, but someone has to be the second pair of hands on him at all times. Alternatively, if for some reason you're forced to give Mac a one-on-one -on -one due to play design or personnel or whatever, get the ball out as quickly as possible. He did not have a sack in the first three weeks of the season, primarily because he was playing against offenses that respected him and obviously knew what he was capable of, and they got the ball out of the quarterback's hands in two seconds or less. And to a degree, it worked for those offenses. He was still able to generate some pressure, but he wasn't getting home for sacks and ruining entire drives because the ball was out early and often. So those two things, realistically, are the only ways to keep Mac from wrecking the game. Double team him on five and seven step drops, and on everything else, just put your quarterback on a two second mental clock. If he makes a habit of holding the ball any longer than that while Mac has a one on one, then he kind of deserves what happens next. And on that note, I want to pivot just a little bit and talk about the difference between a transcendent player like Mac and another young pass rusher in his own division that I did a video on a while ago, Joey Bosa. I caught a lot of flack in the comments for that Bosa episode because I pointed out that over half of his sacks in his rookie year were what I consider to be low quality sacks. Whether they were caused by missed blocking assignments that left him untouched, or maybe he was schemed free on a stunt, or sometimes he was just cleaning up pressure that someone else on his team generated, the majority of his sacks were kind of cheap production. According to my charting, only four and a half sacks out of his 10 and a half total throughout his rookie year were what I consider to be high quality. And you can of course go back and watch that breakdown in full on my channel to get a sense of what I mean by that. But again, a lot of people disagreed with that video because as commenter Matt Maroney pointed out, every pass rusher in the league gets sacks off of stunts and that this criticism of Bosa is both silly and absolutely ridiculous. A lot of people think Bosa is going to prove me wrong about his production being a bit fluky, and to be fair, he still may well do that. But Matt, in response directly to you, I invite you to compare Bosa's production to Khalil Mack's. Bosa had 10.5 sacks in just 12 games, while Mack had 11 sacks in 16 games. So in terms of production on a per game basis, Bosa was clearly a better pass rusher last season, right? Well, not really. Like I said earlier, only four and a half of those Bosa sacks were high quality, but Mac, 10 out of his 11 sacks were high quality sacks, with the only one that was not high quality being where he caught Jameis Winston out in space on a naked bootleg and brought him down with no resistance. But every other sack from Mac throughout the year was earned the hard way. He beat people with speed, he beat people with hand usage, and he beat people with power. He wasn't cleaning up after everyone else's pressure. He wasn't schemed free on stunts. He wasn't left unblocked due to protection errors. Mac had a target on his back every snap of every game, and he still produced at an elite level like an elite player should. That is the difference between him and Bosa. It's why Mac is arguably the best pass rusher in the NFL, and it's why I told people to pump the brakes just a little bit on the Bosa hype train. I'm not saying that he won't be a great player for the Chargers, I think he will be. I made that very clear in my previous breakdown, but watching Khalil Mack after watching Bosa puts things into perspective. It shows you how far Bosa still has to go before he reaches that level, and it shows you that he might have some physical limitations that Mack does not. In fact, I don't think Mack has any limitations whatsoever in any facet of his game. He's already one of the most dominant run defenders in the league thanks to his natural power, he plays multiple positions on the Raiders front, both defensive end and linebacker. He rushes the passer at an elite level, he handles his business and coverage, and somehow he's always in position to make a huge play for his team right when they need it the most. He is everything to this Raiders defense, and without him, I honestly think that entire unit would completely collapse. The NFL is a constantly evolving ecosystem with a constantly shuffling food chain. There's lions and tigers and every bird of prey you can think of all vying to be the king of the same jungle. Pass rushers rise and fall all the time, but usually only the truly great ones stay on top for their whole careers. I have no idea who is going to sit on top of that chain next season, but I think right now, in the present, the answer could not be more clear. The alpha among all alphas is a raider, and if you got a problem with me saying that, well, take it up with the black hole. 
Thank you very much for watching this week's episode. It was made possible by all of our wonderful new Patreon supporters for the week. There's a whole bunch of them, and I've got their names up here on the screen. Thank you to everyone who has contributed to the growth of this channel so far. We're starting to inch closer to $1,000 a month of funding for the show, which is just jaw-dropping to me, really. Clearly, all of you love watching these episodes as much as I love making them, and I really cannot thank you enough for kind of spreading the word and bringing more eyeballs to this show. With training camp starting to kick off next week and fantasy football being on the mind of a whole bunch of people, I want to answer a question for myself that I've been wondering a lot about, and it's something that I'm going to use for my fantasy drafts, and I'm sure all of you will too, and that question is, what the hell do we do about Jay Ajayi? He rushed for literally half of his season yardage in three games last year, and a third of it against one team, the Buffalo Bills. He's getting a ton of first round buzz in fantasy circles this year, which is to be expected, but should owners take the bait? That's a topic that I'm going to explore in depth next Thursday, so stay tuned for that. Until then, later.